So yeah, I'm, I'm Julius. I'm one of the creators of the Prometheus uh, project. And I basically, yeah, this is not really a black belt talk. It's, it's more of an overview intro talk to Prometheus with some Docker stuff tacked onto the end. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about what Prometheus is, why it does the way it does things. And uh, then at the end, show you how you can monitor stuff on Docker uh, with uh, Prometheus. So first of all, what is Prometheus? It is a systems monitoring tool with a built-in time series database. And we care about uh, the entire path of monitoring, so not just storing data. So we give people client libraries to uh, instrument their services or other ways for getting metrics out of things that you care about. Um, and then we collect those metrics, we store them, and then we let you do useful things with them. So query the metrics for some kind of ad hoc debugging, or doing alerting based on the metrics, or of course, you know, dashboarding, having nice graphs on the wall. On the wall. Um, we really care about all levels of the stack. It's not just a network monitoring system or a host metrics monitoring system, but it goes all the way up to service application level metrics. And Prometheus was especially made for dynamic cloud environments where things are moving around a lot. So that theme will come up a couple of times. There are sometimes people confused about what Prometheus is and what it isn't. So we very explicitly do not do logging or tracing, uh, where you kind of care about individual events or w what path uh, with what timings uh, in a, a request took through your entire stack. Uh, we only do numeric time series metrics. Um, if you want logging, use something like Elasticsearch. If you want tracing, maybe you know, open tracing with Zipkin. Um, typically, you, you'll want to have all three you know, metrics as well. Uh, we also don't do any kind of automatic anomaly detection where the system just looks at the collected data and automatically alerts you if something looks odd. But we allow you to define very explicit, possibly complex alerting rules. Also, Prometheus itself only has a local storage, so that's, of course, not infinitely durable or scalable, but that's also by design. So Prometheus started in 2012. Uh, both Matt Proud and I back then came from Google to SoundCloud. Um, and then we started at open source from the beginning, but only really published it in 2015. And shortly later, uh, last year, we joined the Cloud Native Computing Foundation as the second project after Kubernetes. And uh, since then, you know, everything has just been growing and growing. Um, so why did we build Prometheus? Uh, SoundCloud back then was already in a kind of unique situation uh, in that they had an in-house cluster scheduler, self-built, uh, before Docker existed, before uh, Kubernetes and so on existed. And it already used containers and it already scheduled services around dynamically. And SoundCloud back then already had hundreds of microservices and thousands of instances. And these were moving around on different hosts and ports like every day. And the monitoring tools that SoundCloud still used back then were Graphite, Ganglia, StatsD, Nagios, and so on. And they were really from a different age that wasn't really made for this kind of dynamic world. It was for this world where you know, one host runs one type of application and you kind of know where things are and you can configure things pretty statically. Um, Graphite's data model and scalability also wasn't really enough anymore to pinpoint exactly um, you know, if a problem like a latency spike happened somewhere in your service, is it only happening in one service instance or is it happening in, across your entire uh, service? Um, so having that ability to really drill down but also aggregate up and do fancy kind of computations on your time series data was missing. So for, for those kind of reasons and a couple more, we eventually decided to build uh, Prometheus. The architecture of Prometheus is kind of like this. So typically you run one or multiple of these central Prometheus servers in your organization, depending on your scaling needs or your organizational needs. And then the Prometheus server is the heart of everything. Uh, it's where the magic happens. It knows where the things are that you care about. And we call these targets. Uh, Prometheus scrapes metrics from those targets over HTTP in a format that we define. 
And these targets can either be your own web applications that you can directly instrument and put these metrics on, or they might be stuff that you don't want to stick like metrics code in directly, like you know, the Linux kernel or a MySQL daemon. Um, and for those, we have things we call exporters, little sidecar jobs that you run next to the things you care about, and they do the translation of the one metrics format to the Prometheus format. So Prometheus then stores the data, and you can either query it over Grafana, HTTP API, or the built-in UI, or you can also um, configure Prometheus to calculate alerts based on the collected data. And if there are any alerts firing, they will then be sent to a component we call the alert manager, which then does final aggregation, routing, and dispatching to email, Slack, pager duty, or so on. And how does Prometheus know where the things are that you want to scrape? The answer is service discovery. And again, more on that later. So I would say that the main selling points of Prometheus are these four. Um, the dimensional data model that allows you to really track in detail what each metric and time series is about and where it's coming from. Then a real query language to work with that data, collected in that data model. Then the simplicity and efficiency of running a single node. And then again, in this theme of being able to handle dynamic systems, service discovery integration. Let's go through all these four points one by one. First, the data model. Um, we store time series. That's nothing really new. Uh, time series are usually, you know, they have some kind of identifier and then they have a timestamp value pairs. So the timestamp just goes up and the value can go up or down. Um, in our case, the timestamps are in 64s, uh, millisecond precision, and the values are just float 64s because that turns out to work actually pretty well uh, for operational systems monitoring. But the big differentiator to previous systems is how we identify time series. So taking a look back at, for example, graphite or statsd, you would typically see metrics that look like this, a single big long metric name with dot separated components. So in this case, for example, the total number of HTTP requests um, as served by engine X on different hosts and paths and different with different status code responses. And the problem with this is that a, it's kind of user level semantics encoded into this metric name, and it implies a hierarchy that doesn't really exist. So for example, why should the status code be lower in the hierarchy than the path, or why should the host IP be lower in the hierarchy than engine X? So it's kind of artificial. You kind of have to squeeze it into that. It's also hard to extend. If you want to add another dimension, maybe you know tack it on to the end or where, and does it break queries? So what you really want, is, or what Prometheus at least does, um, is a label-based dimensional data model um, where you have a metric name and then just key value pairs attached to that metric name, and every unique set of key value pairs gives you one time series. And this is the same kind of label data model that, you know, Docker has, Docker has labels, uh, Kubernetes has labels, so it kind of fits nicely together. If we look at how we query this, this becomes even clearer. In the graphite case, you would have to know exactly, you know, if you wanted to select only those HTTP requests with the status code 500 of engine X, you would have to know which dimensions to wildcard out, and you would also have to know kind of the meaning of the others. In the Prometheus model, the simplest query is just a metric name, and that would give you all time series with that metric name. Typically, you want to then filter. So in this case, we filter by job equals engine X and status equals 500, giving you the same result, but in a bit more explicit uh, way. Um, so you really want these kind of uh, first class key value labels. So now we collected all that nice data. What, what uh, useful things can we do with it? Prometheus has its own uh, query language and it's not SQL style, <laughs> which sometimes trips some people up at first. Um, it's more of a functional kind of language, and uh, we actually think that it is better at the kind of time series computations that we typically want to do um, than any of the SQL dialects that we have seen for that out there. 
Um, yeah. So let's have some uh, have a look at some examples. So let's say you have a metric called node file system by its total. It tells you for every partition in your infrastructure how big it is. And it, you know it has a, a couple of labels attached like the device, mount point and so on. And now you know you want to ask the monitoring system give me all of the partitions that have a capacity greater than 100 gigabytes but that are not mounted on root. So first we query for the metric name we then add a negative filter on the slash mount point root. And then we divide all these time series that result from that by a billion to get from bytes to megabytes, uh, to gigabytes. And then we can actually filter the set of result time series further um, to get only those time series that are greater than 100. So we get a fully labeled result list of the partitions not mounted at root bigger than 100 gigabytes. A different example is you typically want to know, you know, what's my error ratio, error rate ratio. <laughs> um, let's say you have a metric that tracks all the HTTP requests. It's a counter. It just goes up. So, you know, that's not very useful. So let's first take a rate over it. Um, in this case, on the left-hand side of the operation, we're taking only the 500 status codes. Uh, requests taking a rate as averaged over five minutes over that, summing up all the time series that come out of that, um, and then dividing it by the same thing but for all requests, not just the 500s. So now you get a single number out of that that tells you the entire error rate ratio. But typically, you'll want to preserve some of the dimensions. So for example, let's say you want to have, you want to see this split out by the path dimension which is also attached to this metric name, you could then just add a bypath modifier on both of these sums, and it would preserve those dimensions, and the divided by operator, or any, any binary operator really in Prometheus, um, knows how to match vector elements on the left-hand side and the right-hand side based on equal label values. Um, you can also do more fancy things there, you know, grouping by one direction and the other, depending on where you have what dimensions. You can go fancier, so you can uh, collect histograms of latencies and then at query time uh, calculate uh, quantiles from them, um, where you can say, I want the so and so quantile with this and this aggregation level and over that, that much time. So these are all things that you can decide at query time. <clears throat> and then once you know that language, yeah, it takes maybe a while to learn, but it really pays off. Um, now you can use it in different places. So for example, I usually start out just building expressions in this built-in expression browser in Prometheus, where you can just plug in expressions, experiment a bit, and it will always give you the latest value, the current value of all the result time series. Once you've narrowed that down a bit, you typically want to graph it. So there's a graphing interface. It's very simple, the built-in one. And then at some point, you'll want to share nice graphs actually with your colleagues. So you switch to Grafana for that. Uh, Grafana has native Prometheus support. So you just stick in a Prometheus data source and then you can use the exactly uh, the exact same, uh, <laughs> Thomas pointing at, this is actually from Weaveworks, uh, an example dashboard, yeah. Um, so then you can use the exact same PromQL expressions in Grafana. You can also use PromQL to do alerting. Um, and the way this works is that you define some kind of alert name, in this case, many 500 errors, and then you provide any kind of PromQL expression that outputs a list of time series. In this case, all the paths that have an error rate ratio larger than 5%. So I'm doing the times 100 to get from a ratio to percent and then filtering by five. And uh, all of these result time series, each of these will become an alert and they will inherit the labels of their time series. Uh, you can add extra labels like severity critical that can be used later in alert manager to actually route the alert to maybe a pager instead of an email. And you can add annotations for little actually, you know, message snippets that get put into your notifications. Cool, so for the third point, operational simplicity. 
um, Prometheus itself is a single static Go binary. I don't know how often you've heard that already. Um, it has only local storage. We explicitly avoid clustering in Prometheus because we think clustering is hard and it's also the first thing that might get broken if you really need your monitoring system in a network partition or something. And uh, the way you get high availability instead is running two identical Prometheus servers that pull in exactly the same data, but they know nothing about each other. Um, and then they can compute alerts independently. They send alerts independently to a highly available alert manager, and that then actually dedupes things. Also, the local storage is often enough for some smaller organizations. Uh, I mean, like even having a single big Prometheus server. So we currently do around a million samples per second ingested um, with a new storage that is coming soon. Uh, we'll probably have you know, a larger number than this. It's also important if you want to dimensionally really track in detail where metrics come from to support many time series on a single host. Uh, so we support a couple of millions of series currently, and that will also go up in the future. And we implement a variant of uh, Facebook's Gorilla time series uh, encoding and end up you know, using roughly 1.3 bytes per sample. And the local storage is great for keeping you know, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe even months of data, but don't treat it as a durable storage or really you know, infinitely scalable storage. It's not meant for that. Instead, if you want that, we recently with Prometheus 1.6 introduced a full read-write protocol where Prometheus sends every sample that it scrapes to some remote endpoint that you specify. And then you can implement any kind of adapter at the other end that, for example, writes into InfluxDB or OpenTSDB or whatever. And if you want, you can also implement the read back path so that you can read back from your long-term storage system through PromQL. And we have an example bridge or an example adapter that currently already does this for InfluxDB, OpenTSDB, and Graphite for the, read, uh, for the write case. For, for reading back, we only have it for InfluxDB at the moment. But there's also Cortex from Weaveworks, which is a hosted Prometheus in the cloud, which also uses exactly these protocols. So this is a full native Prometheus long-term storage read-write uh, implementation. So I also encourage you to take a look at that. And yeah, <clears throat> on to the fourth point, uh, the service discovery. So as I said in the beginning, Dynamic environments nowadays pose some new challenges. VMs are being scaled up and down. On top of those, you have cluster schedulers also you know, just scheduling things very dynamically nowadays. And microservices means in general you will have more services than before and more service instances. So how do you make sense of all this mess? And Prometheus's answer to that in general is to use whatever service discovery mechanism your environment gives you to discover the targets. Um, because you, know, you can't really configure your Prometheus to know about everything statically anymore. You can do that in small environments, of course, but that's not realistic in, in cluster environments. Um, and then Prometheus uses the service discovery data, the discovered targets, A, to actually know what the world should look like because that, you know, a monitoring system should know that. Um, and then also to know what HTTP endpoints to actually pull metrics from. And it automatically gets a health signal. You know, if it cannot pull from somewhere, then it already knows something is wrong there and you can alert on that. So the target is down. If the service discovery mechanism is a good one, then it will also give you some metadata about the objects that you've discovered. It might tell you this engine X over there is an environment equals production instance, for example. And then if you so choose, you can map those metadata labels into your time series. Or you can even say like, uh, ones that have this label, don't monitor them. You know, drop them or munge them and so on. <coughs> Prometheus has built in support for a couple of, uh, for discovering, uh, for service discovery for a couple of VM providers for discovering nodes. Uh, also for some of the cluster schedulers, Kubernetes, Marathon, notably Docker missing there, um, and some generic mechanisms like DNS or console. And if, you, if Prometheus does not have exactly the mechanism that you need, 
uh, you can write your own and plug it in with a file-based interface. But of course, we are at DockerCon, and you might be interested in how can I discover my Docker things with Prometheus. So unfortunately, there is no settled answer to this yet. Uh, it's still early days, but we're talking about it. And there are some approaches. One already works pretty well today. So Prometheus, among, uh, many, uh, among some of its service discovery approaches, uh, supports discovering things by DNS A records. And it just so happens that if you have a Docker Swarm cluster and you run services on there, Docker will expose a tasks.service name A record for you and it will give you all the IPs of the individual instances so that you can go and query them. This works today. The downside is it doesn't give you any port metadata. It's just DNS, just gives you an IP address. And I don't think Docker gives me any SRV records yet that could include that information. It also doesn't give me any kind of other metadata, like labels or so. Um, and the big thing it doesn't solve yet is pulling across Docker networks. So typically, if you run many microservices, you might want to put them on different Docker networks so that they're all isolated from each other. But your monitoring system is really supposed to be you know, able to reach all of those so it can pull in the metrics. And this is already good for host and container-based metrics, though. So because it's so. Yeah, so with container metrics, I mean metrics that are externally observable metrics like the CPU usage or memory usage or so on of a container, uh, but not really service-specific metrics because then you'd need to go, go to all the different uh, actual microservices. Um, there is a proof of concept by the people from Container Solutions um, in collaboration with people from Weaveworks. Um, that's a little demon that runs, that has to run on a Docker Swarm manager node <laughs> to be able to talk to the uh, Docker socket and talk to the Swarm API over it. Um, and then it basically discovers the targets for you over that, uh, writes out a target file for Prometheus to co consume uh, with a file-based plugin mechanism, and Prometheus needs to run on the same node to use that file. And then this daemon also handles the attaching of all the required Docker networks to your Prometheus. So this is obviously a bit of a hack, uh, and not the best solution yet, um, but it also it gives you some metadata already. So this provides, during the service discovery phase, you, uh, all the you know, Docker and service labels um, for the discovered tasks. So ideally, we'd be able to reach from Prometheus just some kind of centralized service discovery mechanism that works in Kubernetes, for example, where we can just talk to the API server and it just you know, gives, gives that to us. And then also we need to find a viable way for Prometheus to get to all the metrics endpoints. Uh, there's a Docker uh, issue about this, 27307. Um, feel free to chime in there and study it. Finally, um, Docker with 1.13 has added native Prometheus metrics to the Docker engine. Um, this means that Docker will actually serve an HTTP endpoint where it will provide uh, metrics about its own internal state. So not really metrics about the containers it's running, but about you know, what Docker engine actions have I taken and so on. And to enable this, you will still need to set the experimental flag to true and also then provide this other flag that actually specifies the uh, address and port on which to serve this metrics endpoint. And then you'll get metrics looking some, something like this. So now I'm going to attempt a demo. I hope the network is with me. Um, Basically, I'm going to go into the case where we do the DNSA record-based service discovery uh, and only monitor the cluster and host metrics components. So I am going to run three global services. Uh, one that is just a little SOCAD TCP forwarder that basically on each machine allows us to reach the metrics endpoint of the Docker engine. Um, a node exporter, which is a Prometheus uh, component that gives us node metrics. Uh, host metrics, and C Advisor, a tool from Google that gives us uh, C group metrics, so basically container metrics, 
memory usage, CPU usage, and so on. And we're going to use A records. Because we are going to run these exporters as global services, we can discover each of these uh, on, the, on each node uh, with the tasks.engine or tasks.node exporter and so on um, A record. And then we're going to run Grafana and Prometheus and going to play with the data a bit. So let's start with that. Um, Jerome was kind enough again to provide me a five node Docker swarm cluster on AWS. And right now, it's just empty. <clears throat> da, 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 da. Ha, 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 ha. What? That's, that's funny because it just worked. No root to host. <laughs> Should I reconnect? Yeah, let me try. Yeah, well, the cable. Hmm? Oh, haha, <laughs> cowboy hat. Maybe I need to kill network manager. That sometimes helps. Huh? Let's see. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> this is, I mean, we've got an address. Mm -hmm. Huh. Hmm. Do we know what's going on here? Anyone smart enough? Uh, hotspot. hotspot broken? Yeah, I was going to uh, use the wired, but the uplink on the hub is actually not working. So. Ah. Yeah. Well, this is not working. Hmm. This is probably not the problem, but. Aha. <clears throat> uh -huh. Oh, maybe it is the problem. Okay. Um, yeah, so blame it on system D. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's hope this works now. Docker service LS, Great. nothing there, but I do have a node, what's this, list or LS? Haha, uh, I have five hosts, they're part of a Docker swarm, um, and I have this directory where I have a Prometheus YAML prepared. Um, I scrape everything at five seconds intervals, and uh, Prometheus also scrapes itself, just for good measure. Um, but then it scrapes the node exporter, which is running as a global service uh, C advisor, and this little proxy to the Docker engine. Um, simple enough, that's the entire config. Now we need to somehow pro you know, get that into a container with Prometheus, and uh, as a hack for this, I just have a tiny Docker file here that uses the upstream Prometheus Docker image and just copies in our custom um, Prometheus YAML. To use that, I'll bring up a Docker registry in the Swarm cluster, and then I will build my custom Docker image. Do, do, do. Push the custom Prometheus image to my own registry. So, you know, that failed. Oh, the build failed. Oh, it should be okay though because I built it before. <laughs> uh, so if we, da, 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 so I have a registry. Let's. I mean, we will see if, if Prometheus comes up, right? Um, I just got a comment from there that, that the build failed. But um, cool. So what else do we have here? We have a compose YAML. That's a Docker compose file. A Docker, uh, yeah, with basically services defined. Uh, I define a network, the Prometheus network on which all of my services will live. I have Prometheus itself on there. I have Grafana on there. 
I have a node exporter and you'll notice that I have to mount in some of the sys and you know, procfs directories from the host into that because that's the way that how node exporter gets its data about the host system. And similar for C advisor, it also needs to get some of these di directories mounted in. And then to reach the Docker engine, I basically have a little SOCAT image here that just allows me to uh, proxy through to the Docker engine metrics port. Cool, so let's bring that up. Uh, Docker stack, deploy. Uh, I'll name my stack Prometheus. <clears throat> And hopefully, let's say I go to host one, which port should I take? Maybe I'll look at node metrics first. Um, this is the metrics endpoint of the node exporter. It gives me host metrics about that host. Um, on a different port, for example, 4998, it gives me Docker engine metrics and so on. So these are the kind of metrics endpoints that Prometheus pulls from. Prometheus itself, we, oh, we have at port 1990. And in the target section, we should be seeing that everything looks good. We have discovered five targets for each of these services because there's exactly one process of these running on each host. That's cool. We can actually play around with the, with the data a bit. So for example, let's start with node CPU usage. This is the total number of seconds spent in each CPU, in each mode on every, on every host. So you have this dimensional data going on here. And in this case, it will give you the current value for each of these. These are counters, so you're not really interested in the real, like, actual value, but only of the, in the rate of increase. So let's maybe take a rate as averaged over one minute. And we might also not be interested in all of the dimensions. So like, I don't care about the actual like CPU in there. So let's sum the rates without um, the CPU dimension. And uh, yeah, I'm also not interested in the mode dimension, but I have to be a bit careful um, I need to actually filter out mode equals idle <laughs> because I don't want to count idle time usage. So I'm going to filter that out. And now I'm going to get for every node the actual CPU usage in total. Um, that's pretty cool. Let's check if our Grafana also came up. Uh, again, not localhost, but host number one. Super secret username, super secret password, admin, admin. Good that I didn't give anyone the IPs. <laughs> uh, not now. Yeah, so first step, we need to add a data source. We just conveniently select Prometheus here, call it Prometheus. And here we'll just say, well, the service name of this is Prometheus, so this is going to work on port 1990. We proxy it through Grafana, add, and data source is working. So let's create a dashboard. Mm -mm -mm. Let's add a graph. And I basically, you know, I, I like my expression that I built here already. I could actually graph it over time, see what happens there. Ah, oh, it's so pretty. And I'm going to just take it, uh, plug it into the query field here, and I'll get it in Grafana. Um, I, we don't have that much data yet, so I'll select 15 minutes for now. And maybe now you're not really interested in the exact legend format, but only in the instance uh, label there. So you can put in some format strings into the legend format field here. Now we only get the actual host. Um, we'll give this a nice title. Uh, host CPU usage. Um, ba -boom. Back to dashboard, I guess. Save this demo dashboard. <clears throat> we have some other metrics we could look at. Um, let's see. There are container metrics. Let's maybe go to the console first. Container, uh, also again, CPU usage in seconds, but this time for the individual containers, 
running on these Docker Swarm hosts. Uh, hosts. Um, again, we'll get the CPU dimension and some other dimensions in here. First of all, I only want to see containers that are actually Docker containers and not just some random other C groups. So I will say, uh, what was this? I think ID label, ID equals, yeah. So if the ID starts with um, slash docker slash dot star, now I get only the Docker ones, and now also again, like I don't care about this CPU dimension. Um, and yeah, let's see. Da, da, da. Oh, and I want to rate it again because it's a counter. I don't care about the total number of CPU seconds spent ever. Cool, this will give me now the rate uh, of CPU usage for every container on my cluster. Um, graph that, boom, boom, boom. plug it in. And again, way too many labels. So we're going to actually use, um, I'll say, on this instance, we have a container with the following name. And this looks much nicer already, right? I mean, still, <laughs> maybe you probably, like in, you probably wouldn't want to do that in, in reality. But, uh, so this is like uh, per con container CPU usage. And now the last one is gonna be interesting. Uh, we're going to have a look at the Docker engine metrics. Uh, okay, they all start with engine. Um, there's one metric, for example, that gives you the total number of actions uh, split up by various dimensions that the Docker engine has done so far. Um, so for example, action delete, action commit, create, and so on. Um, and as it's a counter metric, again, we'll want to be able, we want to take the rate over it. Right now there's nothing going on, so it's all zero. Um, but maybe we'll also want to sum that up again uh, without the instance dimension um, to get the total number of actions of each type, but over the entire cluster, not split up by instance. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then we're going to create some Docker events to see if there's actually anything happening there. Do do. And again, we only want to show the action in the legend. We have that. And docker engine action rates, something like this. Cool. Um, now if I actually go to one of these machines and eh, let's see what's there. I'll just kill one of these. I don't want to kill Prometheus itself because that container has my data. And, but I can, for example, um, kill the SoCat one. Um, docker kill. And then Swarm will bring it back up, right? So that's not really a problem. I can also kill C Advisor, just for good measure. And if I refresh my dashboard, I should start seeing some events. Yep, zoom in a bit more. So you see the red is a start action, the blue is a create action. Um, yeah, if I had actually I think first stopped and then RM the container. I think if I RM it, I would also get a uh, delete action. Um, but yeah, this way I now see the entire, you know, the, the sum of all Docker actions in my cluster. That is it for the demo. And I want to point out one thing. Oh, where did I put this window? Ah, I think I killed all my Chrome windows. So, uh, ba -ba -ba -bum. I will have to now display my Gmail in front of everyone or I'll just click this button. <laughs> um, da, da, da. Because there is a Prometheus Birds of a Feather session tomorrow um, where people are going to discuss how we want to do Prometheus monitoring properly for Docker and I would like to invite everyone to uh, join that. That's at 6 p.m. Uh, at night. And yeah, Luke Marson also from Weaveworks is going to be there and hopefully some others. I'm going to give like a short Prometheus intro talk there. Others are also going to talk and I think there's going to be a discussion. So yeah, please join that. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.